The two people featuring in this documentary, Anna and Ada, each became spiritual mediums early in the 20th century, but with quite different styles of mediumship. Anna was only 11 years old when she accidentally discovered her aptitude as her family experimented with a Ouija board. Ada, much older, was an experienced professional trance medium of international standing. She provided impressive phenomena for some researchers while others charged her with fraud. These two mediums feature in a book by Dr Horace Westwood, a Unitarian minister and psychical researcher. It was published in 1949, and my copy is 73 years old, but modern editions are still available online. Westwood was born in 1884 in England in the woollen mill town of Wakefield in Yorkshire, seen here, with all its industrial chimneys still standing, but these have now been demolished. As a child, he attended a boarding school in the fishing port of Grimsby on the North Sea coast. Otherwise, we know little about his early years, except that at the age of 20 in 1904, he emigrated to Canada, and during his life he moved back and forth across the United States border in line with the needs of his professional life. He died in the United States in 1956, aged 72. The first part of Westwood's book describes the development of Anna and indicates what a closed-minded sceptic he was at the time, reminding me of a YouTube documentary I launched in September 2020 entitled Rejecting the Afterlife, the case of Hamlin Garland. In this, Garland, a Pulitzer Prize-winning author, describes a lifetime of witnessing truly remarkable cases of spiritual mediumship, pointing strongly to survival of the spirit in an afterlife. Yet he resolutely refused to accept this might be true, and Horace Westwood was similar, except that by the end of the book he did timidly change his mind in a way Garland absolutely could not have done. Westwood trained as a Methodist minister and missionary, and I expected his move to the Unitarians was just a different flavour of Christian worship. But by consulting Unitarian and Universalist Unitarian websites, I discovered there's no single Unitarian denomination. Unitarianism believes in one God, not the Holy Trinity. They accept the moral authority of Jesus, but not necessarily his divinity with no religion enjoying a monopoly on theological truth. They emphasise the role of reason, which provides for freedom of conscience and speech in the pulpit, and they reject that God saves only those who accept the creeds of a specific church. Many Universalist Unitarians think that life does not continue after death, while for others it's an open question. Few believe in divine judgment or eternal damnation, with Unitarian views about life after death informed by science and spiritual traditions, with individuals influenced by their cultural backgrounds and life experiences. In the United States, at least, you find Unitarian theists and even atheists and agnostics. For me, this information fitted in with what we learn about Westwood as the book progresses. He was a humanist, the purpose of life being to make the world a better place for future generations. One important influence on him began in 1918, when at a friend's house he observed messages coming through a Ouija board. Wanting to investigate the phenomenon for himself, he bought one to experiment with at home with his family. But their initial efforts were a failure. Westwood explained to his children that this board was a kind of toy, and when they tried it, nothing happened until Anna became involved. By the way, there's some doubt about the relationship of Anna to Westwood. Some say her daughter, 
but he changed her name for the purposes of the book. Others that she was a cousin's daughter who lived with them. Either way, as soon as she touched the board, its indicator moved rapidly and with remarkable accuracy, spelling out words and sentences intelligently, things Anna could not possibly have known. For test purposes, West would then turn the board around to give an upside-down alphabet, and he blindfolded Anna, but it made no difference. The information still came swiftly and accurately. Westwood's reaction was that Anna's sensitivity enabled her to explore the subconscious minds of those present, bringing forgotten memories to light. When Westwood then made a Ouija board with the letters scattered in different places, Anna's hand was not in the least confused, since the tumbler remained as quick as before. Indeed, one message came through, suggesting he was a fool to think that the mixed-up letters made any difference. Whoever was inspiring these sentences claimed they would prove that they were invisible entities trying to communicate with the physical plane. But he rejected this idea. I positively refuse to grant them any real existence, he wrote, preferring to credit the subconscious mind with powers he did not actually understand. Since Anna suffered no negative consequences from these experiments, he decided to continue with them, and a week later she developed automatic writing. Whether or not she was blindfolded, Anna still wrote without hesitation, answering the questions that were asked. Soon after the automatic writing began, Anna, who never went into a trance, wrote messages from one signing herself Ruth and another signing himself Ralph. They reported that they'd been government stenographers in Washington, D.C., and that they'd died together two years earlier, in their twenties. They provided information about their lives, but Westwood made it a principle that no attempt would be made to verify it. He was still resisting the survival hypothesis, since it challenged his philosophy. I was not interested in communing with the departed, he said, and proving or disproving survival was not in my mind. What a stubborn man, apparently determined not to discover a great truth. Subsequently, Anna's messages began coming from Ruth and Ralph only, no others, and Anna became a stenographer herself, despite never having used a typewriter. Even blindfolded, Westwood wrote, she could type with perfect ease, Yet without the blindfold, she had to pick out the letters slowly and painfully, one by one. Without Anna's knowledge, Westwood would type questions onto the typewriter page and swift replies would come from Ruth and Ralph. Even Anna conversed while the typing was going on, quite unaware of the skill that her fingers were exhibiting. On another occasion, Ralph instructed Westwood to take a rook from his chess set, that's the one looking like a castle turret, and to place a ping pong ball on top of it like a golf tee. Then, using his briar pipe as a golf club, he should hit the ball at a certain target without knocking down the rook. This was a good game. They required both delicacy and skill, and all the family failed, usually knocking down the rook or missing the target. But in Anna's hands, when blindfolded, Ralph never missed. The rook stayed upright, the ball flew to its target precisely. Westwood then played chess with Ralph. Despite the blindfold, Anna could still make Ralph's moves on his behalf on the board in a genuine game. But without his assistance, she could not play. Anna never went into a trance during these experiments and could still make comments while they were taking place, as she remained watchful and alert. When Westwood asked Ruth and Ralph what they did when they were absent, they told him of their duties welcoming to their side people who had just passed over. They said this greeting process was very stressful, since many of them had no realisation that they were dead. Soldiers from a battlefield seemed stuck in a nightmare, wanting to continue fighting despite having passed over. For Ruth and Ralph, 
Visiting the Westwoods home provided a break from this. One evening, Westwood asked Ruth to play the piano through Anna, who was far from accomplished herself. So the following evening, Ruth brought along a friend, Kate, to stand in for her. Blindfolded again, Anna sat at the piano and began a slow melody. Westwood had never heard it before. It was majestic and unearthly, and he noted that the child's finger technique was entirely different from her own. Later, Kate told Westwood that the scale structure on her side was different from Earth, so it was difficult to express herself as she would have liked. Yet the whole performance was on an elevated level, Westwood wrote, with a musical understanding far beyond Anna's normal power. At another sitting, Ruth requested each sitter to write a question on a piece of paper, and leave it unsigned, fold it and put it into a container. Westwood then shook the container and gave it to Anna, who removed one piece at a time. And in each case, Ruth identified the writer, answered the question, and occasionally acknowledged not having an answer. But despite the success of these experiments, Westwood still resisted the spirit hypothesis, saying that Anna's subconscious was responsible. One night, a spirit calling himself X began communicating. Westwood thought him decidedly superior in intelligence to either Ruth or Ralph. He discussed philosophical matters, suggesting the underlying reality was an all-permeating consciousness with the universe designed for different beings in an infinite series of gradations. Westwood realised he was no match for X, so he proposed a test for him instead. First, Anna would be blindfolded. Then Westwood would walk backwards into his library and with his back still to the bookcase would select a book at random. Without looking at it, he placed it in the dining room with a page open. And then he requested X to give the number of the open page on the right-hand side of the book and write the first 10 or 12 words at the top of the page. X agreed to do this. And when Westwood compared the script from X with the book itself, these scripts matched perfectly. The page number was correct, but the copied words were from the top of the first paragraph and not from the top of the page. On another occasion, Anna demonstrated reading from a book while blindfolded, although she was unable to read through paper. And in the case of letters in the mail, although she could not read through the envelopes, she could still get the gist of the message and name who had sent the letter. She could also find lost items, giving directions on how to retrieve them. But if her spirit guides were not in control of her, she could do none of these things. On Christmas Day, 1918, the niece of a member of Westwood's congregation was killed in a tobogganing accident, a girl called Virginia. Two days later, Ruth reported that this girl was with them and would communicate through Anna, even though Virginia was still dazed. Her first words were, Where am I? I want my mother. And Anna gazed around the room as though looking for her. Westwood told Virginia that she was in the study of his church, whereupon she asked how her mother and baby brother were, despite neither Westwood nor Anna knowing that she had a baby brother. Later, however, this was confirmed as correct by Virginia's aunt. On another occasion, a message came from a child Westwood called Charlotte Summers. She'd been in an adjoining hospital ward where he'd been staying for surgery five years earlier, in 1913. Before he left the hospital, however, this young girl had died at the age of six. Charlotte described their hospital experiences and how she had died and she requested him to contact her mother to tell her that she was still alive and always near her. But Westwood was reluctant to pass on this message since it may be a trick of Anna's subconscious combined with mental telepathy. When he finally did call them, 
Their reaction was as feared. Charlotte's family called it nonsense and wanted nothing to do with it. However, a month later, the Summers urged Westwood to bring Anna to their home. What followed was a wealth of information entirely beyond Anna's possible knowledge that convinced Charlotte's parents that this communication was indeed genuine and they really had been in touch with their daughter. Finally, in regard to Anna, there was the case of Blue Hyde. Ruth asked if she might bring a Native American friend to a seance from her side of the veil, and Westwood was immediately suspicious of Indian guides, seeing them, and I quote, as so much arrant nonsense on the part of sentimental fools who loved to dabble in occult matters and enjoyed self-deception. Later, however, he was glad that he'd given this consent. This visitor was a Chippewa Indian who claimed to have lived a century before. But Westwood was, and I quote, utterly and completely sceptical about the man's existence. Despite Anna never having even heard of a Chippewa, she was nonetheless able to exhibit knowledge of them through drawings that she produced under his influence, and she also borrowed Westwood's tobacco and pipe, and once it was lit, passed it round the family to puff on, with Blue Hyde asserting, We all friends now. It was a pipe of peace, although Anna was ignorant of any such ceremony, even though she was the one who'd initiated it. The purpose of Blue Hyde's visit was to move the Westwood seances on from automatic writing to allowing spirits to speak for themselves through Anna's voice. And when a new voice did come forth, it was a man speaking with an Oxford accent. How could this be? Well, Blue Hyde explained that he'd been taught English by a Jesuit missionary educated in Oxford, England. After this, Ruth and others spoke to them, and each time the accent and intonation changed according to the speaker. However, while this went on, Anna, who was not in trance, could interrupt the proceedings in her own voice if she wanted to. It was a remarkable experience, and Horace Westwood concluded that this was not a case of play-acting on Anna's part. With Blue Hyde present when they were outdoors, Anna found that she could track expertly through the woods, build outdoor fires without difficulty, Indian fashion, and even skin a woodchuck, also known as groundhog, without showing any of the aversion a youngster might be expected to show. She also tracked down a lust basket of blueberries from 300 yards away using Blue Hyde's clear sight. And these abilities were reported to Harris Westwood's friend, Bill, an experienced hunter and outdoors man who was invited to meet Blue Hyde. Bill was initially sceptical, but became convinced of Blue Hyde's authenticity, demonstrating as he did his considerable expertise and knowledge of local ecology. After a full hour's friendly conversation between them, Bill described Blue Hyde as, and I quote, the most expert woodsman and guide I've ever met. Now, you should know that over time, these spirit guides gradually disappeared one by one. First Ralph, then Ruth, who for nearly three years had been what Westwood called the presiding genius. Anna was very fond of her, but nonetheless, one day she simply disappeared. Only Blue Hyde now remained as the experiments diminished, and he too would be gone in a few weeks. And when this finally happened, all of Anna's psychic powers disappeared. The thrilling years of this experience were over. What we experienced here was Westwood having no interest in the survival hypothesis, yet being forced by the strength of the evidence to acknowledge its possibility, even while remaining more than normally cautious. But then he still continued with his interest in psychical research long afterwards. And his favourite theory that the unconscious was responsible for the phenomena took a long time dying. One of Westwood's subsequent mediums was Mrs. Ada Bessinet. According to Nando Fodor's Encyclopedia of Psychic Science, 
Mrs. Bessinet had critics among the established psychical researchers of the day. Professor James Hislop, after 70 test sittings with Mrs. Bessinet, alleged in a 1911 Proceedings of the American Society of Psychical Research Journal that the medium's phenomena were created by herself while in the hysterical state of a secondary personality and without her accepting the slightest degree of moral responsibility for this fraud. Another researcher, Harrywood Carrington, the author of a hundred books, wrote in his book The Story of Psychic Science, quote, My sittings with this medium left me entirely unconvinced of their genuineness. This, despite Carrington having observed curious floating lights at one of her 1922 seances, which, at his request, hovered over photographic plates that, when developed, showed markings that Carrington himself was unable to replicate. Then there's Wikipedia, which specialises in debunking psychics, who refers to the writer Fulton Ursler. During one of her seances, this critic claimed to hear the medium leave her chair. So he moved his shoe over her seat to discover if she was there, and she wasn't. Convinced of fraud and being trained in ventriloquism himself, he alleged that Ada's seance voices were really just her own. And then Malcolm Bird of the American Society for Psychical Research, who attended one of her seances with Arthur Conan Doyle, was also sceptical, although Doyle himself was not. In her defence and following her visit to London, Dr Hewitt Mackenzie thought Hislop's criticism may be attributable not to hysteria, but to the actions of her controlling spirits. Ada had two such controls. One was a little girl called Pansy, a negress who died in slavery, and the other called Black Cloud. In contrast, Admiral Osborne Moore, in his book Glimpses of the Next State, described several Bessinet seances, concluding that her phenomena were both supernormally produced and entirely convincing. So now, let's return to Horace Westwood's book for his perspective on Mrs. Bessinet, whom he knew was well respected locally. On his way to Toledo, where she lived, this is what he said regarding his psychic experiences so far. While I possess no theory as to the significance of the psychic world, I had been compelled to recognise its reality. My scorn had changed to a sympathetic desire to understand, and his visit to Mrs. Bessinet was the first time he'd ever visited a seance organised by others. He described her as quiet, unassuming, gentle, and well-spoken. The seance room was darkened by blankets at the windows. There was no apparatus apart from a coil of rope on the table and a phonograph was operated by a sitter. When the records began playing, the medium fell into a trance and then for half an hour voices sang which did not come from Ada herself. In fact, there were two voices simultaneously, one soprano, one contralto, as well as whistling. And after this, Ada's spirit control, Black Cloud, requested that a red light be turned on. And this revealed Ada with her hands and feet tightly bound with the rope. Westwood's examination of the knots assured him that she could not have done this herself, and nor could other sitters. After the light was turned out, it was then turned back on again, and the rope had been untied and was once again neatly coiled on the table. Next, a voice accompanied a song on the phonograph, and Westwood described it as, quote, one of the most magnificent tenors I've heard anywhere. Such a voice on a concert stage would command almost any fee. The voice belonged to one calling himself Dan, who claimed to have been a victim in the Spanish-American War of 1898. Westwood wrote, but following my general rule, I made no attempt to verify this, which seems to me like a short-sighted determination not to gather evidence that might ultimately oblige him to adopt a new perspective. And so the evening continued with singing, whistling and conversation. 
On waking up from trance at the end, Ada had no notion of what had happened, as was always the case. Westwood summed up the evening as most extraordinary. I did not know what to think, but there was no reason to suspect fraud. Adding, no ventriloquism could possibly produce two voices simultaneously, singing and whistling, while the other sitters, who knew Ada well, assured him of her unimpeachable integrity. After several sittings with Ada, Westwood realised that on each occasion the same voices, whistling and songs, were repeated time and again, as well as the tying with rope. Here was a fixed pattern that was failing to progress or develop, so he wondered whether Ada was simply exhibiting secondary personalities capable of only limited range of stunts. Consequently, he was shocked when at home some of the entities in Ada's seances also communicated through Anna, including the Negro intonation of Pansy, and this despite Anna knowing nothing whatsoever about these other seances. Luckily for Westwood, Ada readily agreed to a research group being formed to try to extend the phenomena. On one occasion, Westwood had his watch taken off his wrist by Pansy, and it floated almost to the ceiling before he felt her little fingers reattaching it again. On another occasion, he noted that direct voices made no breathing noises such as human beings do. And he gathered from Dan the difficulties of creating the mechanism used to create these voices. But instead, he wondered if the voices did not really exist at all. Maybe the group had been collectively hypnotised, and this might equally apply to the ghostly faces that materialised at the seances and lit by a psychic light. Westwood's scepticism was back at full volume. However, one particular test was truly influential. He obtained a dictaphone which recorded onto a wax cylinder through a speaking tube. When this was held up to where the direct voices came from, they were proven to be real. During this seance, a huge hand seized Westwood's right wrist, pulled him up onto his feet, made him pick up the speaking tube to hold it way above the table near the whistling, singing and speaking. And when the wax cylinder was almost full, this hand hung up the mouthpiece and pushed him back into his chair. What Westwood now had was a permanent record of a direct voice printed in wax. To the best of my knowledge, he wrote, this was the first record ever made of any voice produced under such circumstances. Ada was amazed to hear it herself, since she'd never witnessed any of her own psychic voices before. Ever sceptical, Westwood wondered, was it some manifestation of Ada's own unconscious? At subsequent seances, the entities did the recording themselves, while Westwood held on to the medium. The entities also operated the phonograph themselves, and being able to see in the dark announced what was about to be played, something a human being could not do in the dark. So how impressed was Westwood? Quote, Still I was not satisfied, and for two reasons, the question of darkness and the problem of trance. So they tried a seance in daylight with Ada no longer in trance. The entities proved their presence by moving the big heavy dining table, cavorting as though possessed, Westwood described it. The table also raised itself off the floor with Westwood able to place his hand underneath the leg to prove it really was so, after which it gently lowered back to the floor. Later, a face materialised that frightened Ada so much that she fainted, and with this, she said she'd seen all the psychic phenomena she wanted to see, and thenceforward she would stick with her trance condition, and she couldn't be persuaded otherwise. Despite the entities insisting that they'd lived on Earth as ordinary mortals and had interesting tales to tell, after a while interest within the group diminished. The wearisome, repetitive nature of the phenomena caused the group to disband. 
Now let me tell you about one of Ada's 1923 seances. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was touring the estates at the time, giving lectures on the evidence for survival, and he made a visit to Ada. It was a typical performance, the same entities taking part without variation, yet Conan Doyle still declared it one of the most remarkable evenings I've ever spent. Several years later, when Westwood and his wife were living on America's Pacific coast, they were invited to a seance with a lady who joined in with the conversation as the seance proceeded instead of going into a trance. Even so, for Westwood, it was an unimpressive occasion, until suddenly, in words loud and clear, everyone heard an English voice calling Westwood by name. It said, Pardon my intrusion, but I knew you would be here and have for so long wanted to meet you again. This is Arthur Conan Doyle speaking. He conversed with Westwood about a missed luncheon appointment and mentioned that Ada was now on the other side with him, stating that she'd communicate with Westwood again sometime. And as soon as Conan Doyle had said goodnight, a voice alleging to be Ada came through just as clear in volume and enunciation as Doyle's had been, and she was followed by Pansy. But note the scepticism when Westwood wrote in his book, I have never been convinced in my own mind that the voice was that of Conan Doyle, and he wondered if the medium could have arranged a confederate to silently sneak into the room. But then, thankfully, he destroyed this silly idea. When we reach the end of Westwood's book, there's a section entitled, What Does It All Mean? Only at this point does he tentatively accept the possibility of consciousness surviving death. However, he asserts that survival, quote, cannot be proved scientifically, nor can it be more than a probable truth, rather than a demonstrable one. Regarding Conan Doyle, he agreed that the entity had the behaviour patterns of Doyle when alive, but this failed to demonstrate scientifically that this discarnate spirit was indeed Sir Arthur himself. However, he thought it was Doyle nevertheless, and as a final conclusion he states, I must admit, despite all my scepticism, that a door has opened upon possibilities, the potential significance of which is immeasurable. He came to expect that personal character determines an individual's destiny after death, for as he says, each person reaps as he has sown. Nonetheless, for me, Westwood comes across as an arch prevaricator, lacking the courage to declare a positive conclusion based on experience accumulated through years of investigation. Even at the very end of this book, caution remains his watchword, but between the lines, one detects that maybe there is immortality for human souls. Thanks for listening.